Thank you very much. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Kate Barber. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc fellow at Cardiff University. Um, I, I've come from kind of linguistics background, forensic linguistics, uh, but I focus on extremism and online extremism in particular. And today I'm going to talk about um, some data that's coming through, some of the data collection that I've been doing recently in terms of um, the religious right and this um, perhaps potential rise in Christian nationalism. Um, is this working? That's right. I can try it again. Not to worry. Okay. Okay. The way. Oh no. This isn't working either. Just look at this title screen. <laughs> Right, right. Oh, I think it's something to do with that. Sorry. How'd you get the? Uh... There we go. Right. Um, so uh, these are some of the images taken from the uh, January the sixth um, insurgency in um, in twenty twenty one at the Capitol building. And you can see that there's um, some very explicit religious symbolism happening here. And um, there's been some research happening now about whether this is just like the first wave of this kind of uprising in Christian nationalism. So we're going to have a look at um, some of the data that we've had a look, that I've collected recently. And um, this idea of um, churchianity, which um, is a kind of essential part of Christian nationalism. So I'll go through a uh, kind of background on the religious right and um, we're going to go old school. We've had some great talks today about um, more modern platforms like TikTok, uh, but I'm kind of retro, uh, very much. Uh, I like the, the blogosphere. Uh, they're very enduring platforms for ideology. So um, I'm very intrigued with this, uh, but it's been changing. Uh, I'm going to do kind of a before and after uh, just to show you what's going on with that. I'll go through really quickly my methodology, uh, this churchianity idea and how it relates to meta uh, metapolitical discourses and um, discussions and challenges um, that are happening from that. I'm gonna get my watch ready, but okay. Um, so uh, there's this relationship between the religious right and um, the far right, very well documented. There's some great studies there. Uh, as a reminder of some more recent movements, I suppose, uh, the Christian identity movement in the 1980s became um, kind of well known in the, in the, in the field. And then the Kinists in the late 90s, early 2000s also kind of took the idea of Christian nationalism a bit further as well. Very interestingly, and where my PhD research lied was, um, was with the old right, which is very much dormant now, seems to have disappeared or certainly gone quiet underground. And there's this idea that actually a lot of the uh, followers of the old right are becoming more uh, or evolving more in line with Christian nationalism. Uh, for example, one of the bloggers that I looked at a lot was um, Box Day, and he identifies now as both alt-right and Christian nationalist, and he's been quite um, um, uh, influencing in the field. So just to kind of clarify what this is, Christian nationalism is derived from white supremacy, described as this social and political movement with this goal of restoring the US in particular to this kind of fictional Christian nation, which obviously has all the racist connotations associated with that. Uh, this manifests as um, kind of very fanatical behaviour, it's anti-democratic uh, and relies on this rhetoric of fear and retribution. And retribution is really uh, the worrying kind of uh, trajectory of where it's going. Uh, Christian nationalism also focuses on the, this anxiety around this um, loss of white identity, white Christian culture, uh, which obviously fuels the, the far right more globally. So uh, my research, uh, which links in very nicely with some of the talks that we had before lunch, uh, looks at this intersection between uh, white supremacy and male supremacy, uh, in particular the alt-right and the men's rights activist faction of the manosphere. Um, and I finished my PhD two years ago, summer 2022, and um, it's been interesting to see how things have developed since then. Um, like we were saying before, there's some amazing um, platforms now that uh, the far right and the manosphere use. Um, and what I find really interesting is despite all this great technology and these very um, interesting, interactive, brilliant platforms like TikTok, 
blogs are still really quite popular um, and they are really old school, but there's something about them, which in, I think for the far right in particular, who I guess are fairly traditional in many ways, um, it's, it seems to appeal to them to keep using these blogs. Um, they are retro. Some of them look absolutely um, unbelievably 80s, which I quite like as a big fan of the 80s, obviously in a very different context. But um, they uh, they attract a much older demographic. So we saw with um, the um, platforms that were discussed before lunch that they attract very young, horribly young um, oh. users. This is very much kind of the old brigade, um, usually much older men. Um, interestingly, what I have found since my PhD research is that there's a uh, big rise in female bloggers as well, which I haven't seen before. They're very stable. They're very enduring. Um, some of them been around for 15, 20 years. In fact, most of them have been around 15 to 20 years. And from a research perspective, this is really good for me because um, the, the language doesn't change because it's the same blogger blogging for 20 years. So it, there's no kind of issue or problem with the language being expressed or the terminology being used because it's the same person. It's very constant language. So what we can focus on are these uh, changes in ideological viewpoints as opposed to different users, different language. So um, going into the blogosphere, this was my original network analysis process back in 2018 when I started my PhD. Um, I started looking at alt-right aggregator sites. There were two of them that I used. They, they took me to 170 primary sites, as I called them, mostly blogs, but uh, websites and a couple of YouTube channels in there. And I looked at where these sites explicitly recommended other sites to visit in this kind of idea of ideological affiliation. And I collected all of these sites. I came up with 707, which I checked were still active. They had to be active um, within three months for this uh, process. And I coded them for how they identify. So I used an EMIC approach um, to, so I wasn't looking at them and trying to guess their ideology. If they didn't, explicitly say what their belief system was, I left it blank. But where they did say where they uh, explicitly identify, I coded it accordingly. Then I went back into the edges and I came up with this uh, network analysis. And I was interested in this intersection here between this uh, manosphere. Um, Brenna, you were saying about this difference between manosphere and anti-feminist sites. I totally agree. I think they are slightly different. But you can see that they are kind of interlinked up here. Um, and I was looking at where the alt-right and the manosphere kind of intersect um, on this network analysis. Uh, blue was the white nationalist, white, um, white identity, white supremacist groups. And then we've got um, some pale blue linking through. These are the religious sites. So you've got some of them into the uh, manosphere and anti-feminist area, a few in the middle, but not really that many. So that was uh, the case in 2018. And I wanted to replicate it now to see how things have changed. And this is the new one. Uh, so this is up until last week. So I did um, the same, exactly the same process. One of the aggregator sites had closed, but I used another aggregator site. But basically, that was the only difference uh, over an 18 month period. And very, very different kind of look. So we've got far fewer sites, 40% uh, of the original, 20% um, of the edges to kind of link them all up. But what has endured is really interesting. So the most active blogs are affiliated with the far right. These are far right, white nationalist, white, white identity, self-identifying sites. Uh, the yellow, this is the science site. So lots of HBD, which is human um, biodiversity, eugenics, basically, and um, uh, anti-vax sites as well, post-COVID, and some climate change sites as well. These are the more um, pure science sites up here, which are kind of uh, off on the side. Green, uh, hard right conservative, and the blue, the light blue, these are the religious group here. So um, the enduring sites are these four main factions, including this religious right down. Gray was not, not given, but most of them are kind of hard right conservatives. Very few alt right. Alt right have either gone somewhere else or have avoided blogging, as have the manosphere. It looks like the manosphere. Um, uh, particularly the men's right activists, which I was looking at, most of them have um, closed their blogs or they've gone somewhere else. And there are a few trad con, trad conservatives which are around here, uh, which um, kind of interspersed among the religious groups. So this is the religious uh, network analysis here. 
This is interesting. This is one of the few manuscript sites, and uh, I'm going to come back to that at the end. So as a linguist, I use corpus linguistics as my methodology. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you can collect a lot of data and analyze it um, quite objectively. It allows researchers to explore language in um, empirical form instead of just uh, choosing what's interesting. So I collected um, some of the uh, blog posts from the whole range of um, sites that I use in, in both uh, network analysis, um, the, the blogs which carried on, and uh, looked at the uh, hashtags religion and Christianity by three of those blogs there. Uh, it's a very small study, it's a pilot study actually, which we're continuing, uh, half a million words. And this is what uh, came up quite interestingly in the um, keywords that uh, we looked at when we looked at word frequency. Uh, so this idea of churchianity is um, looking at the church in in a derogatory form, uh, saying that there's good Christians and there's bad Christians, and good Christians are the ones that believe in the word of God, and the bad Christians are the ones that um, look at the modern day teachings and tolerances of the church, and it's creating this um, dichotomy between people who believe in the church as a social good and those that believe in the Bible and the word of God. So using the search term with the asterisk there, I can get a whole range of um, different uh, terms associated with uh, uh, churchianity. So this is a pilot study uh, which uh, is being extended to look at legitimation studies in terms of how the Bible is used to leg legitimise violence on these blog sites. Um, bit of a plug, but I've got a book chapter coming out with my, um, my colleague there, my friend Emily Powell, who's done some incredible research on pre-crime narratives in manifestos um, of mass shooters. And we found that there's a lot of mirroring between the language on these blog sites and the language which is used in the manifestos of Angus Brevik, for example. So metapolitical discourses, just to sort of see how this all links in, it's this idea um, that it's laying a foundation of pre-violence and um, Setting, setting in motion these ideas, planting the seed, basically, that um, an uprising should happen. So it's the idea of influencing cultural, intellectual and public domains as a way of preparing for this final revolutionary stage. Uh, it's also been described as this kind of yeah, dormant violent potential, which often leads to um, activism, militant activism and terrorism. And it, it's this slow drip, like drip, drip, drip kind of idea of um, the violence being this natural, necessary, justified next step, having when, when people have consumed all of this metapolitical discourse. So, churchians, so these are people who are seen as the, uh, the bad Christians who are overly tolerant and are uh, taking the church's name uh, down in a bad way. Uh, they're seen as dishonest in this data that I collected. Uh, dishonest in relation to their belief, they're liars, they're deceivers, they serve the world, not Jesus Christ, so they're a traitor to the church, so they're um, already being very much other than denigrated. And we see them as overly tolerant, this is a very uh, key theme that came up through the data um, of this virtual signaling kind of woke idea of um, people in the church being too liberal, um, driving genuine believers from the pews, so there's this action of um, Actually, what they, they don't actually define what genuine believers are, but they, they're seen as being pushed out. So they've already sowed that seed of um, needing to kind of fight back and reclaim what, what's theirs and their place. Then the other, these uh, interesting groups as well. So they are driving genuine believers away while welcoming women, sexual deviants, and atheists to the pulpit. So we've got three groups there that are already kind of classified as the other. And again, this kind of welcoming, welcomism, this kind of woke, that you feel in church and welcomism is seen as this really bad thing. So you can see what's happening there. And it kind of um, goes on and on until you get to this kind of idea of churchianity as evil. Um, and I mean, it's, it's the this biblical language which is being used here, an incredibly violent language. So it's this um, idea of being it being associated with the temple of social justice, it's the church and anti-racism, uh, and churchianity, and of course, reality, Judeo-Christianity, the cult of Babel, it's the religion of the Pharisees, it goes on and on and on, very violent language. Um, it also links down to the, um, the Bible here with the snake of the Garden of Eden, so something which needs to be um, taken out, stamped on, and um, 
got rid of. And then it really does get very quite explicit where we've got churchianity is evil, or absolute devil, even someone like Andrew Brevik recognised it. So it's linking already to kind of taking action and somebody kind of trying to stand up and do something to, to get rid of this idea of churchianity. So, um, early days, but there's this very clear idea of um, isolationism where these discourses are trying to separate the um, people who are involved in these with good teachings of the church. Some people, um, Sunday schools, for example, Sunday schools come up a lot in the data of, of being evil. <laughs> um, and sowing these seeds of distrust and um, trying to stop inclusiveness and tolerance. So causing a massive division in the church, basically. But quite worryingly, um, they, they create this idea of what a real Christian is. And it's somebody who is able to believe in, in using violence to enact God's word. So they're very explicit in that we need to take a stand. We need to stand up and defend what God has said. They, they put themselves in the position of being interpreters of God's word. They delegitimize a liberal church and they enable this religious extreme right wing to be racist, misogynistic, homophobic, anti Semitic without losing their kind of real Christian credentials. So they can still claim to be Christian, even though they believe in all these awful things, uh, because they've already kind of um, delegitimized what the real church is. So this, this lays the ground for this very slow burn violent potential where violently defending true Christian values becomes a kind of natural next step. And interestingly for me as well, having worked on um, areas of the manosphere, it also allows space for this Christian manosphere to evolve. And I don't know how many people are looking at this. Uh, it's something where my research is certainly pending and I'm doing some work on this now. It's this um, idea of using uh, Christian values to really um, cement what a lot of the manosphere discourses were about in the first place, but also this retrenchment of equal rights. So what we were saying before lunch about this kind of dialing back of um, dialing back into more traditional gender roles again. Here's some examples of the uh, Christian manosphere, which is uh, worrying and kind of funny at the same time. So these are from that red dot on the um, on the network analysis where I said that was a manosphere site amongst all of this religious stuff. So lots of ideas like this, is your family really living a Christian life? Um, do all women hit the ball? Very typical kind of manuscript. This course is here about women being old and hitting the door. Um, but some of the language they're using as well is straight from the manuscript in its traditional sense. We must become godly men. Such men are those who have awakened themselves to the lies of the modern world. So very much the language of the red pill. And um, the idea of being spiritual warriors, so placing themselves in this position of um, warrior ready to fight anyway and defend Christian values. We've also got the um, uh, indexing of women as you know, either godly or non-godly, and the, the idea is that you have to find a godly woman. Other examples from the Christian manosphere, um, Christianity and masculinity uh, is one blog site that I was looking at. And uh, we've got this celebrating men, the image of and glory of God. Some big questions here. Did Jesus have a sex drive? <laughs> Not sure what that's relevant for. Um, and something like this. This is what I mean by the retrenchment of um, equal rights. Should women be allowed to vote? No guessing what the answer is, according to this guy. Actually, it's not actually what you think, I, I imagine. Um, voting must be done solely by families. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. As long as you're married, you get a vote. One must be married with kids in a traditional biblical marriage. None of this other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but then the more you get, and so most people, people can vote. Perhaps you have to be married, but family should only get one vote. And then we've got since the Bible says that the man is one of the household, speech of a bill, the vote requirement. So actually, women can't vote. So the only people that can vote are married men in traditional biblical marriage. So that's where we're going. Um, so it's it's worrying because this is um, this was from last month, uh, and I think looking at network analysis, there seems to be this kind of move away from some of the more traditional uh, men's right activist stuff. A lot of the PUI PUA stuff I was looking at, but this is this is emerging quite strongly, and um, yeah, quite worrying as I say. That's a bit of a whistle stop. I think I'm probably before time actually for the first time in my life. 
Uh, Mr. Reckonses, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, happy to answer any questions.